I just want to make a few reminders. Uh, people should make sure to fill out their teacher survey form and leave that with us because this is how we improve our teachers' conferences with your feedback. Uh, and you can just leave that at the front desk at the entrance. Uh, I'm uh, really pleased to introduce our next speaker. Uh, like one of the other session chairs said, this is a professor who's got some named chair that he has, so it means he did something important. I can't tell you what the names are, but I, I'll, I'll give a, a, a looser introduction. Uh, so Andrew Burnoff is a professor. He's the chair of the mathematics department at Harvey Mudd College, just down the road, so to speak. Uh, uh, I don't know if he knows this, but uh, we, we grew up in the same rough area. That is, I'm from the Philadelphia area. And when I was a kid, I was kind of like a math, physics nerd kind of kid. And uh, and uh, all my friends were too. And <laughs> we were, you know, we were members of the math club and we went to these competitions and we did fairly well. And there was, there was this kid that we kind of viewed in awe. He wasn't our grade, he was ahead of us, but but it didn't matter because his legendary name, his name was Andy Burnoff, and <laughs> and there were some stories about him. So one one story was that at one of these math competitions, they had asked, well, what what posi what number when uh, when inverted is equal to itself, but with the decimal place shifted one place to the left, and Andy Burnoff spit out the answer immediately. Remember the answer? The square root of three. No. <laughs> Wait, are you the same Andy Burnham? <laughs> Wait a second. Square root of ten. Square root of ten. Square root of ten. Thank, you. Of ten. Thank he, you. He spit it out before, you know, as soon as the question was asked, before the question mark could have been placed. Square root of ten. Yeah. And we were impressed by that because, because uh, in retrospect, the answer was obvious, but but we we were we thought oh it would take at least a second to do that not. Not uh, 30 milliseconds, <laughs> but uh, but uh, uh, anyway. Uh, so uh, Andy Burnoff uh, was a legend even when he was a teenager, at least in the eyes of my my crowd. And uh, uh, I, I also want to say that uh, uh, Andy uh, is uh, well known for his work on swarming, and I'll just point out one example in, I guess it's the latest issue, because these come out quarterly, in the latest SIAM Review, which is the main journal of SIAM, the Society for Industrial and Applied Mathematics, on page 709, uh, though actually there's an intro on page 707, so this was in December 2013, it just came out, there's a long article by Andy and Chad Topaz on, uh, it's co basically called a primer on swarm equilibria, which is uh, relevant to his talk today. So uh, I'd like us all to give a warm KITP teacher conference welcome to Andrew Burnoff. <laughs> Thank you, Greg, for that charming and somewhat embarrassing introduction. Um, I'd like it when people clap for me, but let's try and do this again. I'd like to see if we can all clap in unison. So, good job. Let's do this again, except I'm not going to lead you this time. Go ahead. So, thank you. Okay, that was very nice. Okay, um, no, I'm supposed to give a talk now. So, why don't I do that? Well, I, I want to introduce you to the idea of synchrony. Uh, one of the things that I think humans are programmed to do is to imitate others and to synchronize with others. And the amazing thing is a lot of synchronization happens with a leader. So when I was leading you to clap, that was easy. But a lot of synchronization happens without a leader. It happens basically independent of that. And there's all sorts of examples of this. If you think about sleep-wake cycles, the reason we go to sleep and wake up when we do is because of the rising of, and the setting of the sun. Um, flowering of plants um, happens with seasons. So these are things that happen with leading. But, I mean, for example, the clapping exercise there, you didn't necessarily have a leader. Okay. 
dancing is another interesting example. It turns out contraction of the heart muscle is something I've studied a little bit. And what happens is there's a fiber which gives an electrical impulse, and that impulse starts a wave of contraction that goes around the heart, and that's what causes the heart to beat. Okay. Uh, it turns out lasers and microwave ovens are actually instances of resonance where what you have is, is, is uh, basically atoms that are oscillating at particular frequencies and emitting light or emitting microwaves. Okay. And um, there's an interesting experiment you can do. Uh, some of you may have seen me doing this at lunch, uh, playing with some of my favorite tools. And this is synchronization of metronomes. This is an experiment I think was actually made most famous by Stephen Strogatz. But what you have is five um, metronomes there. And they're on a board. And um, the gentleman's going to start them all up. And you're going to see that he's going to lift it up. And when he lifts them up and puts them on top of one or two soda cans there, he's actually causing them to become mechanically coupled. When they're on the table, they're pretty much stabilized. But when they're on this thin board, they're coupled. So let me show you what happens. OK, completely out of phase. He did four or five goes to get this, but pretty amazing. Okay. So the question is, why do they synchronize? And the answer is coupling. And I want to make sure that I, I'm clear about what I mean by coupling. Basically, all coupling is is the influence of one object on another. Okay. And this can happen a lot of different ways. It can happen through sight. It can happen through sound. It can happen through vibrations, which really is what's going on with those metronomes. Um, Insects have ways of signaling each other by leave, uh, releasing chemicals called pheromones, which other insects can sense. Okay? Um, the internet is an amazing coupler. And what I mean is, is that it used to be to communicate with somebody, took days, weeks, or months. Now it takes milliseconds. Okay? Um, vibrations, as I said before. Um, it turns out that also a lot of insects have some interesting coupling mechanisms. Crickets chirp, fireflies flash. And these all can lead to synchrony if there's some sort of feedback mechanism through the coupling that causes things to want to synchronize. So um, I want to show you yet another experiment here. Um, this may be pounding things home. On the left, I actually have a simulation. This is an 11 by 11 array of oscillators. Uh, they're being simulated mathematically. On the right, I have 32 metronomes. Okay? And the idea is that in this case, everything is coupled. It turns out, oh, it got very loud. Excuse me here. Um, it turns out the coupling is stronger in both these systems when things are nearby and weaker when they're farther apart. And what I want to point out, too, if you look at the left now, basically everything's in phase. Uh, you see them oscillating back and forth. And you'll see they get more white and more black in the oscillations as it goes along. On the right here, things are still pretty much chaotic. But if you give it some time, these are all going to synchronize also. Um, so there on the left, you see we have these nice white-black oscillations going. On the right here, if you look, almost all of them are now in phase or out of phase. So let's give it just a little bit longer. It always seems longer when you're standing up here. Right? There we go. You see how it's shaking back and forth a little bit? The, um, so for example, if you look at the third row there, they're all in synchrony. Um, Left-hand side now, we're all synchronized. It gets to a point here, by the way, where all of them are in syn synchronized except for one. And that one eventually falls in the line. See, the second one on the right there is the one that is red. It's a black piece of the pattern. So, okay. Anyway, you get the idea. Okay. So 
feedback can lead to synchronization. And coupling occurs in other ways too. And one of the things I want to actually stress is that as humans, we are naturally prone to imitate others. Um, this comes up in an interesting idea. How many of you have heard of a meme? So a meme is an idea or behavior that spreads through cultural coupling. Uh, this could be something like fashion. It could be something like um, fads. Um, an interesting thing is to talk about whether or not religion is a meme and whether or not you were theistic or atheistic. I think one of the things you would, believe, you would agree is that, um, that religion is, is, is communicated through people talking, telling the gospel. Okay, so it's spread through communication. Um, reality TV is definitely a meme. I don't know how many of you remember the, plank, the planking craze that went through a few years ago. Uh, let me tell you about my favorite meme, um, which is Bieber fever. Okay, um, if you're interested in talking about memes, the place to go is uh, two places at Google. There's Google Trends and Google Zeitgeist. Um, this is the number of, of Googlings of Justin Bieber on the internet. And I'll point out that in 2009 here, you see that this suddenly took off, okay? This became an extremely popular search term, like among the top 10. And by the way, you see the spikes there, you know. This is Justin gets his first tattoo. This is Justin gets involved with Selena Gomez. You, you get the idea. Okay, so basically there's this resurgence of this over time. This is something that's actually been studied by mathematicians. Here is a paper on the mathematical model of Bieber fever, okay, where they claim it's the most infectious disease of our, disease of our time. Okay? So the idea is if you have coupling, ideas spread also. And Bieber fever is you know, it's, a, it's an example of fashion, it's an example of meme. Let me show you another one. Okay? These are baby girl names, the most popular names by state as a function of time. So we started out lots of Marys, now it's all Lisas, okay, in 1967. And you'll see Michelle is making a, an assertion here. And now the, the most interesting one I always think is the Jennifers. Okay, so in 72, Jennifers took over as the most popular baby name. Is there anyone here named Jennifer? If you are, I'm not gonna ask you how old you are, don't worry. Um, okay, but through 72 through 78, Jennifer turned out to be the most popular name. How did that happen? Well, the answer is people kept hearing the name Jennifer and they said, oh, that's nice, maybe I'll name my baby girl Jennifer. Okay. So and now you see the Ashleys and the Jessicas of the world have taken over. So um, yeah, so uh, memes also spread this way. So what have we learned so far? I think the thing that I want to bring home is that coupling can lead to synchronization. Coupling can cause things to happen at the same time. Coupling of human behaviors leads to memes, to ideas that are spread and communicate. And I want you, I think most of you agree as humans, we're, we're programmed to imitate each other. We're pro we are coupled together. And the big question I want to explore is what does this mean for animal behavior? Okay, so I'm about to start talking about swarms, which are basically driven by coupling of animals. Uh, by the way, if you're interested in this stuff, uh, the guy you want to learn more about is a guy named Steve Strogatz. He has a fabulous TED Talk. You'll realize the thing I did with the clapping. I stole wholesale from him in the beginning of his TED Talk. He has a book out called Sync, um, but the TED Talk really is worth going to, I'll just say. Okay, so let's talk a bit about swarming. Um, so what do I mean by swarming? Basically, I want to talk about biological aggregations. We've had a few talks about this already. Um, in the left are the infamous starlings. Okay, we've heard a lot more of the, about those. I'll talk a little bit more about them. We have some zebras. You see they're, they're again, forming a nice uh, uh, herd there. On the right, we have bacteria. Okay, um, and you can see that the direction of motion is correlated. In the center here, we have something called a fish mill, which I'm going to talk a lot about. Um, and I'll just point out, it's not only animals that swarm. These are, this is actually a robotic swarm here. Okay. And this one here, I probably just shouldn't talk about. Okay. Any of you that have kids will know what that's from. So, so what do I mean by swarming? I want to talk about the aggregation, basically the grouping of coupled objects. So the idea is that things that basically clump together because there's some sort of coupling between them. And we have all sorts of different names for this. Birds come in flocks, animals come in herds, fish come in schools, insects swarms. I mean, bees, ants, and locusts are examples there. And then you saw the example of a robotic swarm. Um, let me talk a little bit about swarms in general. 
um, when you look at them, often objects appear to move in a coordinated fashion. This is a fish mill. Uh, and again, I think we saw an example of this earlier today. The fish sit there. They propagate in a, uh, uh, a clockwise direction. And they'll just sit there and go back and forth unless they're disturbed. Okay. Um, aggregations tend to propagate without a leader. It's not like one of the birds stands up and says, hey, follow me. Okay. Basically, they will, uh, they're following each other. And somehow order arises and a direction arises out of this spontaneously. Um, the way these things happen is through, um, is through social interaction. And um, what I want you to see here, this is actually something I'll come back to in a little bit of a uh, while. This is a locust swarm. Um, and this picture was taken in northern Africa. Locust swarms are among the most destructive insect infestations out there. They cause billions of dollars of damage. One of the things that's amazing is the locust swarm, when it takes off, it starts propagating in some direction in a very particular fashion. But here's the thing that's shocking. That's about how far a locust can see. That's about how far a locust can sense other locusts. So again, how do they know what direction to go? How do they orient themselves? How do they form these, these massive swarms? And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Okay. Uh, another thing is that uh, these aggregations, they often seem to have very sharp edges. Uh, there may be some uh, protection reasons why that's a good thing. And if you look in the interior, you often see aggregations that have near constant density. Um, finally, um, I just want to show you a quick picture here. Let me again. I'm gonna... okay. I don't know if you've seen this, but these again are the, uh, the starlings. Um, it's kind of amazing just to watch these patterns. And this really is what got me hooked in swarming in the first place. As you see these patterns, they form spontaneously. Um, they have a lot of sort of depth and texture to them. And again, here you can see, you can see the fine edges. And it's just amazing. How do they make Okay, so um, I want to talk a little bit more about swarming. And actually, at this point, uh, I, I'm told that, uh, uh, that you know, it's after lunch. I decided I need to sort of wake you up a little bit. So we're actually going to do a group swarming activity. Um, what I want to do is I'm going to divide you into two groups. Um, so you're the green group. Can you um, pass these out? Everybody on this side, you want to get a green piece of paper. It's okay. You can read it. Okay. Um, this side is the yellow group. OK. Um, so let's see. Go ahead and pass those out. Okay. And now, here's the tricky part. We're now going to go outside. OK. So in fact, um, So we're going to explain outside because we want to get videotaped. Okay. 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 Oh, sorry. Okay, so here's what I need you to do. This is the playing field. I'd like to all line up over here along this line here, or over here along this line here. Okay. Doesn't matter what color you are. In fact, ideally, you'll be equally distributed between the left and the right. Okay, so for those of you who are coming out, you want to distribute yourself behind this line here. Actually, you can move up to this line here. Okay. Or this line here. You, you, can, you, um, you can wander around in this area, but I don't want you to get outside the area. So if all the green people have green pieces of paper, we'll come out here. Okay. Um, and I want you to distribute yourselves randomly so some people come back over here.
and you have to wait for the start signal. So stay put for the moment. And when I give you the signal. And once you stop, do you start again? Pardon? Do you start again once you come to a stop, or you just stop? Again? You just stop. Okay. okay. Although you might turn around and go another direction if you if you decide that the center of the group changes. Okay. Okay. So are you ready? Let's get let's give this a go. And by the way, you're ignoring the people on the side. They all have yellow pieces of paper. They're they're you're only looking at the people with the green. So are you ready? Okay, it looks like we have reached an equilibrium solution here. So if you look, the, I'll just want to point out, people are roughly equally spaced, the density is roughly constant, and the group is roughly circular. Got that? Okay, so now I'm going to send the green swarmers to the outside. The yellow swarmers, hang on for just a moment. We have to demonstrate the proper behavior. So, Gray, can I put you over here? So um, let me borrow that for just a second. So the idea is if you're a yellow swarmer, you walk at a slow, constant speed. You walk uh, toward the person, the people you see in front of you, okay? And you're going to turn right if you're going to collide. So let's give this a go. Hey, Greg. Hi. Hey. Okay. Make sure you know which way is right. I don't want any collisions here. Okay. So, um, okay. So let's get the yellow swarmers out. Okay. So, oh, whoa, oh, oh, I'm sorry, you haven't started yet. Just sort of distribute yourselves randomly. Are you uh, so on the signal? Let's go. You, you turn around. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So something happening here. Okay. You can turn around. It's okay. Okay. Yeah, if you reach the boundary, you can just sort of bounce off. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So there's something emerging here. You just keep moving. Okay. If you hit a boundary, you just bounce off. You you just okay. Okay. So just keep just keep going. Okay. So I want to point out what's happened at this point. Let's stop them. Don't move. Don't move. Everybody is moving what's called a mill. You're moving in a circle and following each other. Okay? So it turns out that these are two different behaviors that are seen in natural swarms. And I'm going to tell you about them, but we have to go back inside now. Okay. That was great. I love the way it actually worked. <laughs> I think if you bounce off, you have to bounce to the right. You hit a yeah, yeah. It's like hitting a person, right? You go to the right. Mm -hmm. I should have said something. I'll know for next time. So that, I, that worked good. That's a good one for, uh, yeah. for the class. <laughs> okay. Um. Okay. I don't know if I lost the microphone or not. The microphone, where was it? Oh, it's here. Great. Okay. I thought I'd lost it. Okay. Yeah, um, and I should have said that if you hit the boundaries that you, you should bounce inward.
Okay, um, I'm going to come back to this in a second, but I've been told that good teaching technique is after you do an exercise to sort of come back and re, re, so go over what happened. So in the first group, um, everybody walked towards each other and basically they stopped. And what I'll tell you is this is like animals that are primarily sedentary, they're primarily stationary. So for example, if you look at um, a lot of grazing animals on a plane, you look at uh, cows, you look at buffaloes and things, they like to be in groups. This may be a protective mechanism, um, but they spend most of their time stationary. There are, however, groups of animals um, which generally are moving. So for example, fish don't just stop. They're usually swimming, okay? And they usually swim at a constant rate. Um, and in this case, if you have um, fish, and indeed that they're, they're swimming towards the center of a group, what you've seen is, is that they can spontaneously organize into what's called a mill. Okay? And that's uh, the thing that I want to get across more than anything else is that, is that the behavior is really very simple. But the pattern that, are, that emerges is somewhat complex. Okay. So I want to talk to you about how some of these behaviors occur in particular systems. And I'm going to talk to you about systems which I've studied. Okay. So the first thing I want to talk to you about is locust swarming. And uh, I've done a lot of work on modeling uh, locust swarms. I'm basically going to just scratch the surface of this. Um, swarms are primarily, uh, uh, locust swarms are found primarily in northern Africa. The amazing thing is a swarm of locusts can have 10 billion individuals in it. I mean, they're enormous. Um, they can propagate 10 to 100 kilometers a day. By the way, all this information is in a nice UN publication. That's why it's in, um, it's in um, metric units. Um, and as they propagate, as the local swarm propagates, it tends to eat everything in sight and then some. So they cause um, a famine. They cause lots of food shortages. This, by the way, again, is a, um, it's a National Geographic uh, video, and you can see you know, here are individuals are trying to, to get the locusts off of their crops, but when you see how many of them there are in the, scar, uh, in the sky, you realize what a futile task this is. So um, here's a, a, a headline from uh, 2012, last summer, uh, two summers ago, I guess. Um, and it's talking about basically um, swarms in Mali and, and, uh, and Niger. One of the things that's very sad is that Things that happen in one country actually can propagate into another country. I mean, that's the scale in which we're talking about. So if you don't end up doing interdiction, if you don't end up trying to stop swarms um, where they start, uh, they can basically just sweep from country to country in northern Africa and cause a day, uh, great deal of famine. And you read things like some people have resorted to eating plant leaves. You realize just what a desperate situation this is. So anything we can understand about locust swarms, any suggestions we can make, about how to stop them are really important. So um, we decided to study this problem. Um, and Chad Topos, who's my collaborator on this, is, is actually really great digging through the bio biology literature. And it turns out that there's, there's things that are really understood about uh, locust swarms and the formation of them, uh, basically what you might call the geometry of them. Uh, this is um, from um, uh, a book by Uvaroff. He wrote a two-volume set on grasshoppers and locusts. In, uh, in the 70s, it's amazing how much information is in that two-volume set. But here's this picture of a, uh, a locust swarm. Basically, what's going on here is they propagate downwind. Each black dot is a locust. Um, they tend to land when they get in front of all the other individuals. Uh, they rest and eat. I mean, resting should really be, say, eating here. And the idea is that when the, the swarm is moved over and there's no individuals above them, they then take off and fly over top the swarm. So basically, this thing rolls forward. It's sometimes called tractor treading. OK. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's, that's, that's a good question. They somehow know this. OK. And uh, let me come back to that question just a little bit. In fact, hopefully, I'll address it along the way. Um, and there's, there's actually there's something about this picture that's perhaps slightly misleading. There's no scale in this. This is a schematic. So in fact, when you see locusts, they go all the way down to the base. OK, so, so we, started to decide, we decided to try and build a model of this. So what do you do when you want to build a model? The answer is you get some bright undergraduates. So this is uh, Sheldon Logan and Wyatt Toulson. Uh, we wrote a paper about this that came out in 2008. 
Sheldon got his PhD from UC Santa Cruz in electrical engineering, um, is actually now working for Google. He's also an amazing p pianist. Uh, White went off and worked for a few years, then he just, he's actually will be graduating in a few months, um, getting an MBA from Stanford. Okay. So, um, and that's Chad, Pose, Chad Topaz, who I always nicknamed Smiley over there. So, okay. Chad's a faculty member at McAllister College. So, okay. So, let's start building a model. And the idea is you want to build a model from very simple assumptions. So, the first thing you do is you put in attraction and repulsion. And this basically is what we did out there in the first swarming exercise. The idea is that if I'm a locust, I'm attracted to the crowd. But if I get too close, this is often called a collision avoidance mechanism, I stop. And what you see is that under a set of, a set of attraction repulsion rules, what you see is you, you basically locusts will form into a swarm that's circular. Okay. Now, uh, any physicist in the room will tell you there's not enough physics in this model. So. The next thing that you know is that a locust basically, if it's not flying, is going to settle. So you have to add gravity to this. So let's see what happens when you add gravity. So I'm going to take a swarm. I'm basically going to put in a gravitational field. The other thing is, is that this is an impermeable boundary. This is the ground here. So let me show you a motion picture of what happens when you do that. The locusts settle. And now you see you get a bunch that are airborne and a bunch that are on the ground. One of the things that you can see is that the ones on the ground repel the ones here. So the idea being is you have this avoidance mechanism. So when you see lots of locusts on the ground, you say, hey, I better keep flying. And what you might imagine is, is that there's a layer here. And the ones that are flying, the ones above them, see the ones below them, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so that actually is that the information propagates upward, but it propagates upward through small sensing distances. They all end up stacked on top of each other. And the last thing you need to add to this is the wind. Okay? And when you add the wind, you see the following. So the idea is if you assume the locusts are propagated with the wind, the um, swarm starts to roll. The ones in the back say, hey, there's nobody above me. I should take off. Okay? They're actually attracted to the individuals out there. The ones at the front say, there's nobody on the ground. They get pushed down. They end up landing. Okay, very simple model. Now, let me tell you about all the details I've pushed under the rug. So for the physicists, this is a set of coupled first order equations. It's n squared, basically every, every locus is interacting with every other locus in, in terms of some kernel. Um, but the other thing I wanna just point out here is that this model has about seven parameters in it. That's a lot, okay. And it turns out that this behavior is only seen in, in a particular parameter regime. And that particular parameter regime tells you something about the sensing distance of a locust relative to some other factors in the problem. Okay? So you learn something about locusts. You learn basically, uh, if you put together a simple model, something about the regime they operate in. Uh, there's, okay, so you can add noise to the system. It doesn't make very much difference. Okay. Oh, and I should be really clear about that. Okay. Um, there's no noise in the simulation I see there. Okay. This is also a fairly small number of particles. If you have a large number of particles and you add noise to it, um, nothing much changes until you get to a certain threshold. Okay. And then you start seeing things taking off from the ground and, and, and it destroys the structure. Okay. But a small amount of noise doesn't destroy the system. So, thank you. Uh, okay, so um, let me move on to a different system here. Okay, uh, I want to talk to you about uh, rotating mills now. So now, so remember the second system we saw where we had things that were attracted to each other but moving at a constant velocity. Um, a mill is a rotating circular swarm. So you see this in fish. The amazing thing is you also see this in what are called ant mills. Okay, if if an ant is following a trail and you somehow direct it back to the beginning of the trail, you can get ants that will basically march in a circle and then will continue to march until they die. Okay, so this is something called an ant mill. Um, ants, it turns out, like fish, tend to propagate at a constant velocity um, and they're attracted to their peers. Okay, with ants, there's something going on with the chemical sense. Okay, with fish, not so much so. Okay, so, um, 
if you're going to model this, what you need to do is figure out what are the ingredients that you want to put in. So um, if you're, and, and this actually brings up what is one of the most difficult things about doing modeling of biological systems. So let me tell you a little bit about myself. I started out doing fluid dynamics. The fluid dynamical systems that I often ended up modeling, you could put in all the basic assumptions, you get a set of equations, you could solve those equations, and it would reproduce the behavior that was seen in experiments. For biological systems, that's incredibly difficult to do. So if you're thinking about fish, you've got neurobiology, you've got, uh, you have to do, there's some very interesting studies done on fish behavior. How do fish react when they see other fish? Okay. Um, you have to worry about things like ocean currents. You have to worry about fluid dynamics. But what we've done is actually start with a very simple model. And the simple model you know. It's the model I gave you on the yellow sheet of paper. Okay. Now, it's been converted into a set of differential equations. But let me show you what happens when you simulate that model. Um, so the model basically is self-propulsion. Things move at a constant velocity. You have attraction and repulsion. Uh, that is, I'm attracted to people unless I get too close. You need a collision avoidance mechanism. We had turning to the right. There's other mechanisms you can use there also. And let me show you a numerical simulation of this. Okay. So this actually was done by a colleague of mine, Andrew Bertozzi, who's at UCLA. Andrew and I have worked together for years. Interesting thing is you see there's some sort of organization, a circular swarm. You'll see there's a bunch going clockwise, a bunch going counterclockwise. One way usually wins. Uh, it's not always the same way, I'll say. And we actually saw this. I don't know if you remember watching people out there that, that at some point there was a majority trend for people moving one direction and they recruited the others to go the same direction. Here you see there's one outlier there. Maybe didn't read the instructions correctly. Uh, okay. So there you see you can actually build a fish, fish mill out of simple ins, uh, instructions. So a very simple description. By the way, I want to point out that um, people often exhibit milling behavior also. Uh, this is an ice skating rink in New York Central Park. Okay. Um, I'm convinced that they have some things in the center, but if you just put people out on the ice and told them to start skating, that this would emerge naturally. So, okay. Okay, where does that leave us? Well, I want to tell you about some of the things we're working on at present, and um, this is amazing. I'm actually going to finish on time, okay? I want to talk to you about some of the frontiers in the science uh, from a mathematician's viewpoint. Um, one thing which we heard some talking about this morning was talking about sparrows. And uh, I actually had sparrows up on slides, took it out because I didn't think I had time. Let me talk to you, oh, sorry. I'll get to that in a second. Okay, it's always good to remember what's on your slides. Um, one of the things that's, that's, a, um, that's a, uh, a real challenge is these swarms have enormous numbers of individuals in them. And it turns out that if you want to do a computation with 1,000 individuals, you have to worry about the effect of every locust, every individual, and every other individual. So you have pairwise interactions. And if there's n individuals, that's n squared interactions that you have to worry about. That's a lot. 1,000 squared, well, that's a million. A million squared, that's a lot. Okay. <laughs> Um, so one of the things that we've been working on is some parallel computing ways of looking at this problem. And um, there's what's called a Barnes-Hutt algorithm. This is basically a way of dividing things into regions, doing calculations inside the regions, and then building things up. It makes the calculation much simpler. The other thing we've been doing is doing this on um, what's the, the modern fad in computation. We've been using uh, graphical processor units. These came out of, these are basically computational units that are programmed in a strange language called CUDA. But um, where they came from is video games. Everybody wants their video games to be really fast. So you have these graphics cards. They're cheap, and they're fast, and they do some amazing things. So we've actually managed to figure out how to simulate a million individuals here. There's something quite interesting that came out here. Um, so, so I have made a conjecture about something. If you look here, there seems to be more individuals on the outside than on the inside. It turns out if you look here, the density goes to, to infinity um, as the number of individuals increase at the outside of the boundary. And that's something which we didn't expect. Um, one of the things I've often wondered is if I look at these videos of sparrows about whether or not that might be what's going on when you see these, these concentrations of density towards the outside of them. Okay. So um, we have some theory going on in this. This is something you, you can't see with a thousand, but with a million individuals, it's pretty easy to see. 
So. So. It's, so it's, it's actually n choose two. Okay, so it's n times n minus one over two interactions. It's still a lot. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, um, it's um, yeah. So let me talk to you about the second frontier, and uh, this is where I was talking about the sparrows. One of the things that got me interested in this field is the following: Do you see swarms forming beautiful patterns? And you would like to understand where those patterns come from, and you get something at the macro scale, and you'd like to understand what are the interaction rules. Okay, so here are a bunch of ducks. They're actually what are called surf scooters here. Um, they're clearly organized into a flock here. Can you say something about what the individual ducks are doing? That's what's called an inverse problem. I give you a big picture of something, and you want to try and determine the individual interaction rules. So. The two places which I know that there's been a lot of success for this, first of all, is the sparrow studies, okay, where there's been a lot of um, argument that basically sparrows just see the six or eight sparrows that are closest to them, okay, and that's what drives the interactions. They're imitating the very close neighbors. And this is a study that was done by a collaborator of mine, uh, Leah Edelstein Keshet, where basically they went out and they found these surf scooters. They put together a fairly simple interaction rule. And what I can tell you is that if you look at a duck, they have a model that fits the data quite well. And what they've learned is that a duck basically, it's most likely to follow another duck that is over here or over here that's not directly in front of it, but a little bit at an angle, okay, and not too far away. So it has some idea about the right spacing to be at. And there's something about it wants a neighbor up here and neighbor up here, and that actually is enough to organize the swarm. Beautiful study. Um, very difficult data analysis problem. Um, we decided that we wanted to study this in insects. We would have loved to have done, done this in locusts. Ian Cousins is a real expert on this. Um, you can't actually do experiments on locusts in the US. It's illegal. You can't import them. Probably a good thing. So we had to find an insect which we could work with. So we've actually been doing studies on aphids. Okay, These are pea aphids. You see the black dots moving around? Okay. So those are actually individual aphids crawling here. What we do is we put a bunch of aphids in, a, um, in, a, in a, an arena. Okay. We do motion tracking of them, and you get something like this. So every squiggly line there is an aphid. Let me tell you how aphids are different from ducks. Okay. They're, they're smaller. No, 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 no. Um, there's something really interesting that emerges here. Okay. So it turns out. Aphids like to form groups also, but they do it in a very different mechanism. Okay? So with ducks, you know, they actually sort of position themselves very carefully. Aphids, it turns out, run around pretty much randomly. But the following is true, is that aphids spend a lot of time stationary. And if they run around randomly and they wander around and they happen to get close to another aphid, they're more likely to stop moving. So this is a mechanism that is more random. Basically, lots of random walks. It's what a mathematician calls a biased random walk. We have a model where we've put together the probabilities of aphids staying still and what their turning angles are um, and done some predictions on this. The statistics we look at, we get sort of 60, 70% of the behavior predicted. It's clear we don't have everything, but what's interesting is that's, that's a biased random behavior. And this is more like the run and tumble mechanism, which people were talking about earlier, is that there, there are these mechanisms for moving up gradients. But one of the reasons that this area is so fascinating is because different organisms, different, different mechanisms. There's an awful lot here. And because it's biology, every time you dig a little bit deeper, there is more structure beneath it. So, so let me just tell you quickly what did we learn today. Coupling can lead to synchronization. Think about the metronomes. Coupling in social networks, you can think about memes. Think about Justin Bieber. OK, on second thought, don't think about Justin Bieber. <laughs> Okay. In biological networks, this sort of coupling leads to swarms. Often you can model what's going on in a swarm without knowing all the biology, just putting together some basic assumptions for them. And then you can start closing the feedback loop to try and get more and more uh, uh, accurate models. And secondly, um, um, swarm, swarming uh, models can actually give you some insight into what goes on with locusts. Um, and let me end by just thanking my collaborators. Um, so this is a swarm of undergraduates who've helped me out. This has actually been an ongoing project. 
Um, this is a mixture of Harvey Mudd and McAllister undergraduates, and I have three amazing faculty colleagues. Leah Edelstein Keshet, who's taught me more about mathematical biology than anybody else I know. She's at UBC. She's actually written a book on the subject. There's Chad Topaz, who's my collaborator at, um, at McAllister College. And Maria Dersonia, who is a physicist by training, who knows an awful lot of statistical mechanics and has taught me things on that side. So let me thank you for your attention. So we'll open it up for questions. Remember, wait for the microphone uh, when you have a question. Okay. So to come back to the locusts, um, when they're on the ground, they're in a 2D configuration, but they're also sensitive to what's above them. Mm -hmm. Let's say the swarm has moved on. Now above them is empty. Why would they want to take off as opposed to just crawling forward? So in this model, what we see is the reason they take off is because they, see, um, they, they basically want to be near other locusts. So they see the other locusts leaving, and they follow them. Okay, but okay. they don't care that they're near the ones on the ground already. Uh, they don't care that they're near the ones on the ground, but that actually may be a function of our model. Now, something is going on biologically with this. So let me tell you the advantage of having this tractor in motion is that if a locust just sits there and eats surrounded by all its, its um, fellow locusts, it's going to die because it's going to run out of food. So the reason that this, this, this tractor tread of destruction moving across Africa is so destructive is because the locusts take off again and land tens of kilometers down, downstream, okay, downwind, and start eating again. So there's definitely a mechanism there. We put together a very simple, minimal model where, where basically the attraction of the locusts on the ground for the ones in the air were enough to get them to take off again. But there's some simple biological system um, signal that says, if there's no locusts above you, take off. Okay, and that gives rise to this, this tractory motion. So. Excuse me. With the fish mill, we saw a, uh, it was a clockwise, mm -hmm. and it was instigated by instructions for a right-hand turn. And then in some of the models, they were they could either go clockwise or counterclockwise. In nature, you see some things that are almost like um, driven by chirality, like climbing vines and things like this. Do we see? Do you see um, a prevalence towards clockwise? And have you found anything that's going to drive that? So in the systems I've looked at, there doesn't seem to be any chirality. I want to be really clear. Why did I say turn right? Because I just wanted to make sure people didn't run into each other. Okay. <laughs> But um, you know the, the uh, probably the, the uh, collision avoidance mechanism for fish is they see somebody coming and they veer off and go a different direction. The other thing I'll say is that in nature it's very odd to have two things actually come head on towards each other. So chances are they're more doing that than this. But for me, the turning right it's a safety thing. Okay. Oh yeah, yeah. And um, chances are that what goes on in a fish mill, the direction is chosen. It's, it's chosen somewhat randomly. Maybe it's influenced by some of the environmental situations. Um, everything I've read suggests that they go both ways. So. In the evening, do, do uh, locusts stop swarming Pardon? at night in a new moon? Um, so locust behavior is incredibly complicated. Um, uh, from what I understand is they eat day and night. Okay. I mean, they just basically continue on. Okay. Uh, there is a change of behavior, but the point is, if, is that this tractor treading motion basically continues. Um, let me talk a little bit more about locusts. It turns out that one thing I, I didn't get a chance to talk about here is that um, once they start swarming, it's all over. Okay. Locusts are fascinating for another reason. Is it turns out that locusts at low density are actually very solitary insects. So you put some locusts, there's not very many of them. They'll run away from each other. Okay. The problem is, is that when they overpopulate, they start running into each other. And they undergoing, end up undergoing something called an epigenetic change. So they go from what's called a solitary phase where they don't like other people, uh, other locusts, sorry. Um, 
anthropomorphizing. So basically where they will run away from other locusts to a gregarious phase. And I, I have to tell you about one of Ian Cousins' most fascinating experiments. The reason this happens is because they nip at each other's legs. Okay, and there's nerve endings on the on the on the femurs of um, uh, of of the uh, of the uh, locusts. So Ian decided he wanted to study this, and he severed all the nerves for a bunch of locusts so they couldn't feel anything behind them. And then he mixed them in with regular locusts and ran an experiment and went away for a while. And he basically put red dots on the back of the locusts that had had the surgery done. And he came back, and none of the locusts with the red dots were still there. All the other locusts had actually eaten them. Okay, so the uh, cannibalism is part of their life cycle. Um, so there's this tactile interaction between them that drives a lot of the behavior. And once they get to a certain density, they both congregate, and then when they get to another certain density, they start flying. So the behavior, their life cycle is very complicated. And the thing that has become clear is that by the time they swarm, it's too late. What you want to do is kill them. Well, they're still at a low enough density, they haven't swarmed yet. But um, it's one of these things about biological systems. Every time you dig into them, there's more and more detail you have to model. And we've done some models of locus phase changes and, um, uh, and whether or not, um, for example, if you, can, if you can distribute resources in a way that they don't concentrate, if you might actually be able to, to stop them from uh, swarming. And we have some ideas about that, but I have to say the theory is here, the reality is over here, I happen to feel like we've moved it to about here. But trying to get all the biology into the models is very, very difficult. Um, how much of the swarming patterns have to do with the, the air and the fluid dynamics? Um, that's that's uh, an interesting question for uh, another reason. Um, remember we were, uh, the last talk talked about Reynolds numbers? OK. Um, there are two sorts of models which you look at when you look at particle models. In one of them, they're uh, uh, an object in motion. So basically, you specify accelerations. You're all physicists. You know what accelerations are. Okay. So you, you drop a you know you drop a sphere. It accelerates at a certain rate. Um, so basically, you change the acceleration of a model of of, of a locus, and it's, and they tend to sort of move at a particular velocity, which is determined partially, partially by air resistance. Uh, there's a second set of models where basically you specify the velocity. And it turns out that for big terrestrial atom uh, organisms and for small insects, the second model is better because it's actually it's, um, it's a low Reynolds number phenomena. So basically, if, if you have small things, they're more subject to resistance, air resistance, or resistance uh, fluid drag, okay? So it plays a big role in determining the set of models that you see. And um, uh, you know, with, with birds, air, um, they're primarily moving at constant velocity with a small amount of drag. If you look at small insects, they see a lot of drag with a small amount of propulsion. And it's a different sets of models. Um, I don't know of anybody that has actually gotten to the point of modeling swarms and really incorporating what I call honest to goodness fluid interactions. I mean, it's just, it's too many things going on at once. Um, there are um, some groups at Cornell, Jane Wang comes to mind, who've looked at individual insects and looked at the, their interactions with, with, um, with uh, the fluid around them. But trying to do multiple insects and do interactions is sort of, it's at the edge of what we can think about doing at this point. Um, are there other questions? I, I'll just make a comment that uh, uh, Andy mentioned Leah Edelstein Keshet. She uh, not only is a good researcher, she's also written some pedagogical books or uh, things like textbooks, I guess that you could say. With uh, There's a famous one by her and Lee Siegel. Mm -hmm. uh, if you have advanced uh, high school students who want to understand about mathematical modeling in biological fields, they might Go look at this book by Edelstein, Keshet, and Siegel. Uh, and I'll also mention uh, uh, that Maria uh, de Sonia is uh, going to be here at the KITP as a KITP scholar uh, this, later this year. And uh, um, she's going to be participating 
in our non-equilibrium avalanche program, and I think also in our program called Superbugs, which I mentioned earlier. Um, so uh, she's uh, she's somewhat local. She's at Cal State Northridge, I believe. That's right. right? Yeah. yeah. Anyway, well, let's thank Andrew for his great talk. Thanks. They answered my question. And uh, we have a break now um, in the courtyard, and uh, we meet back here at 3.30.